So first I have to apologize my, myself for my heavy English and to be uh, very late in my duty, so it, it was impossible for me to give my whole text before the Congress, so you don't have my text uh, in the book. Don't look after. So after I apologize, I apologize, thanks. Thanks to Gracia Dorel Ferré and thanks to the museum to have invited me to write and to talk about my work and beyond about my passion. Before to really begin, I have to quickly present myself and explain my researches and my methods in a, in a quite long introduction. <clears throat> so my name is Simon Delbut and I'm teaching and researching in geography in University of Lorraine in the city of Nancy, northeast of France. I work since about uh, 20 years, uh, around 20 years, about industrial landscapes especially with a view for regenerations of towns and districts in a way to redevelop former industrial territories, of course, and my work uh, includes the heritage issues. So I'm a geographer, and as a geographer, maybe I'm a little bit alone here because uh, most of you are uh, architects, maybe sociologists or economists, and especially historians. <laughs> Because our object, factory towns, workers' village for this Congress, uh, seems for many geographers, not me, not me, for many geographers, but not me, seems to be linked to the past. It doesn't seem to be the future of the economy and society, and maybe that's why geographers are quite few to be interested by industry in general. However, Heritage studies and industrial heritage are interesting the geographers as elements for the development or redevelopment of the territories. It's through the heritage that industry came back in geographical subjects. So why a geographer like me began at the end of the 20th century, uh, 20 uh, years ago, to work on this subject? For four reasons. First reason reason, because of personal history, because my parents and grandparents were workers in a textile factory town in Lorraine, and I was growing in these landscapes during the period of a strong decline for this industry. The second reason is a pure geographical reason, because my university is surrounded at each scale, regional scale, local scale, by industrial wastelands or industrial heritage and fortunately, active factories. Third reason, it's an economical reason. Because there is a need for experts in industrial landscapes, industrial regeneration at all levels, technical but historical, sociological, geographical too. This need of experts comes from many stakeholders of urban planning private and public, in northeast of France and in partner regions uh, in neighboring countries such as Luxembourg, Germany or Belgium. So we have contracts with them. It's not only pure research, it's really a pragmatic specialty. The last and four, four reasons, uh, reasons because uh, uh, why I am interesting by uh, by uh, industrial landscape, it's because in my university, in geography, we use a landscape approach. So I have to explain this approach, and this approach particularly fits the study of factory towns for two main reasons. First reason is that the landscape approach allows to study the factory town as a system a set of interactive elements directly or indirectly related to industrial production. You have uh, productive elements, the factory, sorry, I'm too, okay, <laughs> that's better. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the microphone is, well, was too near of me. So you have productive elements, such factory, settling ponds, uh, waterways, chimneys, headquarters, and many other things linked, directly linked to the production. You have non-productive elements, such, of course, workers' houses, uh, commercial and, and, and social services, cooperative shops, crash schools, gardens, farms, social center, etc. Uh, all, all these elements form a system. 
this constitutes a system. The second reason of use of landscape approach in this work is that many elements of the factory town are still visible even years after the failure of the system when the system no longer works, still visible in the current landscape. In this approach, we see the landscape as a palimpsest, like these old medieval manuscripts where, under the most recent writings, it's possible to find what was written before. François Béguin wrote in 1995, the landscape is a kind of memory which registers and adds up the history of successive human activities on the earth. So this landscape approach allows us to identify factory towns even after the closure of the factory itself. Even if the factory is finally destroyed, the former workers' houses are still here. The former workers' gardens, former crash schools, shops are still visible in the current landscape. I am convinced that this approach could help us to identify, to categorize, to classify workers' villages and factory towns. This is the aim of my work because we need to go further than case studies and thematic studies about towns of textile industry or chemical industry or steel industry. Because we need a frame, we need to have the same words, a kind of grocery lexicon to treat the same object with the same words, and, in, and it's in fact very difficult. I will try to propose something, to propose some words about uh, these factory towns and workers' villages, but with the certainty that it will not be perfect, and I will let you with many unanswered questions at the end of my presentation. In my first part, I will question the model of the factory town around its foundation, around its definition. In my second part, I will try to show the many limits of this definition. And last, in a third part, I will try to show you that beside emblematic, symbolic, and well-known plan workers' villages or plan factory towns, there is a kind of gray zone, an in-between category of factory towns, very different from planned factory towns, and that I call unplanned factory towns. This will be my third part and last part. So first part, what brings us together here are the factory towns and workers' villages. It seems to be a simple notion with a simple definition. A whole town or a whole village totally built or nearly totally built by an industrialist beside, beside his factory. From the landscape, the factory town can be modeled like that. I use a picture, the landscape, to uh, go to a model, to draw a model. So you have on the pictures, uh, it's, a, it's a glassworks uh, factory town, the Verrie de Porcieux in northeast of France. You can see, uh, during the, the, the pictures is from the, the, the 50s, 1950s. You can see a factory, there's a chimney. You can see, of course, workers' houses, workers' garden with the toilet at the back, um, houses for managers, church, social buildings, uh, uh, cooperative shops, coal power plant, etc. And I, uh, I use these pictures to build a model, a model that, that can fit other factory towns. This organization that, you, uh, that I modeled here uh, can be called in geography a geosystem. It's based on the notion of ecosystem. A geosystem is a set of interactive elements which is visible in the landscape and which forms a clear territory. We can, for example, recognize in the landscape and analyze agricultural geosystems, pastoral geosystems, touristic geosystems, and industrial geosystems, such as this paternalistic form. In this example of Verri de Porcieux, uh, we have a perfect concordance, uh, maybe I, I forget this one, industrial geosystem for me is the basic unit of industrial paternalistic landscape. So this model, basic unit. In the example of Very de Porcieux, we have a perfect concordance between the industrial geosystem and the factory town. The two are the same, in fact. We can even question, at this point, the necessity of distinguish industrial geosystem and factory town. It seems to be, no, but only no, the same thing. 
And this model can be seen in all over the world and in any periods from proto-industry to second industrial revolution. The most comprehensive examples of industrial justice systems and factory towns are well known. You can, for example, speak, speak about Arvida in Canada, Togliati in Russia, in, in any parts of the world and in any periods. Or the example I choose is Bataville. Bataville, it's not only one factory town. It's a network, an incredible network of factory towns. It's black, black spots on the maps. You can see these small black spots in America, North America, in Brazil, in India and Pakistan, and many in Europe here. So I show on the, on the computer. <laughs> I have to show here. Uh, this network was built, this incredible network of factory towns, was built by a shoemaker, Thomas Bata, mainly during the interwar. The mother and the model of Batavilles, of factory towns, of Batavilles, was Zlin, now in Czech Republic and then in Czechoslovakia. So the model has been repeated in many countries, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Switzerland, UK, USA, India, France, Canada, the Netherlands, all on the same model. As you can see here, in three of this Bataville, you can see the same model of factory. You can see the same model of workers of this, in Czech Republic, in France, in UK, for example, here. We have here an archetypal and very well planned factory towns built in the middle of nowhere around the factory, and the whole city is clearly created by the industrialists. Of, on the map of the Slovak Bataville, called Partizanske, the model of industrial geosystem is clearly apparent and perfectly match the idea of factory town. You can see factory, worker services, social buildings, etc. The most comprehensive, the most representative, the most planned and the less distorted of these factory towns are now protected by UNESCO as world heritage, including the factory, of course, but the workers are these too and much more. This is the case of Reros in Norway, Frebentos in Uruguay, or Crespidata in Italy, here, with beautiful workers' houses at the first plan, or Solter in UK, with a big textile mill and workers' houses and the social center, famous social center. Uh, and, uh, so if I would stop my talk here, we would have a model and many examples that fit the model, and we will hear today and tomorrow many examples that suit very well this model. In fact, this simple notion, when we look at it with attention, is far more complicated because of many reasons linked to time, place of birth, creator, size of the factory town. We will see that in my second part, the difficulties and the limits of the definition and the model. When you work on this subject, and especially when you compare factory returns between them, several questions can be asked. The first, and uh, Gracia Dorel Ferre uh, talked about uh, just earlier, it's a question of creator. The expression company town is frequently confused with factory town. In fact, the creator of the factory town is not necessarily a company, a firm, as it's usual in North America. It could be an industrialist alone. It could be the state, especially in former communist countries, for example. To be clear, all company towns are factory towns, but all factory towns are not company towns. Second question, a question of place of birth. The place where the factory is built could lead to the formation of, of a factory town or not. Many factories are built in the countryside, near mines or near a river to use water as energy. There is no urban settlement settlements nearby, so the industrialist is forced to build an industrial geosystem which become a factory town. However, some factories are attracted by pre-industrial cities because of the presence of a possible workforce. In this case, the industrialist do not need uh, to build workers' houses to build services, because there is possibilities to find flats, houses, services, commercials in the nearby city. 
So these factories built an incomplete, unfinished, imperfect industrial geosystem. And this forms just closer to the pre-industrial city, uh, uh, as a very close suburb, is only an industrial district. In French, we say un faubourg industrial, an industrial faubourg, in fact with a mix of factories, warehouses, some workers' houses, some shops and bars, with a very chaotic landscape. Is, uh, here is an example. It's my city of Nancy. The city center is just here at the left. And you have here a waterway, here a river, and between the river and the waterway, you have this chaotic landscape with some factories, some warehouses, some coal deposits. Uh, oil deposit, railways, and some worker sources, um, some shops, some buildings. It's very chaotic. It's not a factory town. It's an industrial district near a pre-industrial factory. So here we are li leaving the model of factory town to what we can call an industrial city. I use this term to refer to a pre-industrial city that hosts factories, not industrial paternalistic paternalistic geosystems, and to differentiate these cities from factory town. Third question, a question of size. Where is the limit between workers' villages and factory towns? Is this only a matter of number of inhabitants or something else? In 27, uh, nearly two, two, 10 years ago, I drew this map of Lorraine and I use, a, I use the following criteria to select factory towns. Uh, in this map, factory towns uh, are red spots okay, in, in the region. Uh, the, following, the criteria is the following. I selected the communes which have had more than 2,000 inhabitants between the first, the first census in early 19th century, before the Industrial Revolution, and today, and of course with the presence of one or several factories on the territory. The result wasn't very satisfying because some real factory towns are missing. For example, the famous Bata Bataville. We have a Bataville just here between Lunéville and Sarbro in the countryside. But you, you can't see it in the map because the factory town of Bataville is extended on two communes and you, you, have, you haven't 2,000 inhabitants in each of these two communes. So I, I, I didn't select selected it in this map. So I, I, this criteria of number is in, of inhabitants, it's not satisfying. And moreover, the number of inhabitants is not significant enough and inadequate because a real city in geography needs something other than a large amount of inhabitants. To be a city, an agglomeration needs to be attractive on the neighboring territories with commercial, cultural, political, administrative services. So the limit between workers' villages and factory towns could not be only a question of, num of number of inhabitants, a matter of size indeed, but a question of attractiveness with the quality and the quantity of services built in the agglomeration. It's possible to know that, it's possible to measure that, to evaluate that, but it's more complex than only counting inhabitants. By the way, I've, I forgot why 2,000 inhabitants, because in France, in C, uh, National Institute for Statistics use this limit to uh, categorize urban communes to, ca to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, qualify a commune as a town, in fact. Fourth problem, and last, last problem with our definition, a question of time. In the beginning, the industrial geosystem merges perfectly with the factory town, as I, I show you in Verri de Portieu, for example, but after several years, the model is more and more blurred, more and more fuzzy, more and more unplanned. I will use this example. On this landscape of the factory town of Town Les Vosges in Northeast France, you can see the initial industrial, the original industrial geosystem in red. Factory, factory here, worker sources with, with a beautiful Cité Jardin, Garden City. Social, uh, social buildings, uh, houses for managers, uh, farms, all in red. Okay, it's the initial geosystem. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. That's far better. <laughs> so you can see uh, where I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you can see in red the initial industrial geosystems, as I showed you just earlier. And uh, this industrial geosystem creates, created the factory return at the end of, of 19th century. But you can see to that 150 years after the creation of the factory, there is many things around the former industrial geosystem in red. First, very quickly, a part of the factory town escapes to the geosystem because some workers had not access to the houses built by the industrialists. So they had to find a flat or a house in the nearby village. This is the orange, the orange star. Uh, just here, uh, in the nearby village. And this district, this old village, with the creation of bars, shops, some uh, houses, escapes quickly to the planning of the industrial system. Second, you can see on the picture two other small former industrial system, circle in violet, here and here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in these circles, you can see a factory, workers' houses, school, and services. A few years after the first and main factory, two other factories have been built, creating two other geosystems and brewing the model of the initial and planned factory return. Third, and moreover, the decline of the main factory during the second part of the 20th century and the growing influence through highways, highways in black on my, uh, on my picture, the growing influence of the neighboring towns tends to more and more blur the model with new buildings in yellow. And the very well-planned factory towns evolves to another version, a factory return far less planned and somehow disorganized. This trend from planning to unplanning is very common, and it affects a large majority of the planned factory returns, and that leads me to speak in my last part about another kind of factory returns, less known, less to die. So I pass this example because uh, I haven't the time. And so last part, unplanned factory returns. In this case, from the beginning, the industrial geosystem doesn't match to the factory town. These towns are real factory towns, but their birth and their genesis is far different from, from their planned counterparts. First, they have a non-specific landscape. I use this example. Far from the very recognizable landscape of the planned factory town, this landscape of Fresneville, Fresneville 2000, 230 inhabitants in north of France, this landscape is typical of the landscape of an unplanned factory town. You can see, in fact, the same elements than in a planned factory town, but with no plan. Several small factories, here, for example, a new one, an old one, uh, of workers houses, a line of worker houses, beautiful houses for the, uh, the industrialists, services, small workshops. All these things, all these elements have no clear organization. In fact, we have several small coalescing industrial geosystems. I draw the circles around these geosystems. Small industrial geosystem coalescing, each incomplete, in which forms a factory town without organization, without a clear center, for example. So in the case of unplanned factory town, you have several industrial geosystems for one only factory town. It's clearly a factory town because the agglomeration town or village was born thanks to the industry. Without industry, no agglomeration, no town. So we really have a factory town here, but not in the same model that the well-known planned factory town. This kind of landscape is in fact very frequent, but less studied, less known for several reasons. Three reasons. First reason, the, uh, the planned factory towns have captured the attention of the researcher and of the people in general with the spectacular development around heavy industries. It has eclipsed the unplanned factory towns. Second reason, 
the unplanned factor returns are very less visible in the landscape than planned factor returns. About the cluster of Vimeux in northern France that includes several unplanned factor returns around small metallurgy, locks and taps, a geographer, Gérard Baron, wrote uh, in 1985 this sentence. The factory disappears in the vegetation. In the Vimeux, the factory is discrete, included inside the small towns. It seems that the factory is slowly inserted inserted in the agricultural village structure. So this lack of visibility of specificity in the landscapes leads to a lack of interest for these unplanned factor returns. The third reason of this lack of uh, interest is, there, is that their constitution is, ge is generally ancient and slow, very slow, that we will see in the following part. This kind of factor returns is linked to the development during proto-industrial times of industrial clusters. It concerns, it, it concerns rural regions where farming was no more able to give enough work and enough earnings to a growing population. So before the industrial revolution, the inhabitants can't migrate to industrial basin and to a planned factor return because they don't yet exist, of course. So they have to find alternative livelihoods. They use craft know-how to develop new activities in small workshops. And if this activity is successful, it slowly grows and the success is copied by other inhabitants. It creates an economic development. And with the industrial times, several years after, some workshops evolve to factories, sometimes quite big factories. The success is promoted by the competition between companies working in the same specialty, and this leads to innovation, flexibility, and adaptability. So we have here a mix of small workshops, of um, homeworks, of factories, big, small, of some services, some lines of workers' houses, but not so much because uh, workers can find uh, houses in the village. And this evolution generates a very chaotic territory, a village or a town which is not planned, but which is a real factory town or a real worker's village. Uh, because the structure, the town, the village, is born from the industry. But this time, not from a single industrial geosystem, not from a single factory, from several factories or industrial geosystems. These characteristics leads to specific policies when the time of crisis and urban regeneration comes. The decline of the industry in this urban form is far different from the decline of a planned factory town. In a planned factory town, the decline is brutal, is abrupt. We, 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 the factory closes, there is only one factory, so factory is closing, we have, uh, we have had uh, a, a prompt reaction. In an unplanned factory town, the decline is obviously slower because you have several factories and workshops and they don't close at the same time. So we have a slow decline, and during this slow decline, the unplanned factor return or workers' village fall asleep. This slow decline didn't promote an awareness on th of the need of an urban renewal. So at the end of the process, they have to react. They have to build a real city, and it's very difficult. They react to, to, to two direction, to two, two, two direction. First, uh, they have to plan the unplanned. Uh, they have to create a center. Th that's the example I choose uh, in Golbet, northeast of France. You had five industrial geosystems, a factory, worker sources, each one with a factory, some worker sources, and uh, some services. These five industrial geosystems, it was textile industry, surrounded an old village with a church here, where you can find bars, shops, uh, and some houses for workers too. Uh, each system has evolved differently. And the closure of the plants extended from the end of the 60s to the end of the 90s. Uh, 
When the last plant closed down, the municipality had to plan a new city. Uh, and they decided to create a city center. They enlarged a crossroad in the old village near the church, just here, by destroying, by the destruction of two old farmhouses. And they created a new square where they put fountains, benches, trees, surrounded by shops near the church and the town hall to create a friendly centrality that was missing in that city. Second direction of reaction after the closure of plant, the second kind of reaction, sorry, in the unplanned factory towns, targets the heritage. It is not easy to preserve industrial heritage in this kind of factory town because there is no spectacular element, no obvious landmark such a blast furnace uh, or a very big factory or a wonderful set of workers or this. Here we have only small heritage elements a kind of vernacular heritage. What is possible to do is only modest actions around discovery trails, some panels with explanation, some work with QR codes or smartphones application. We can see that in this worker's village of the Vimeux, called Betancourt sur Mer. So you can load uh, online this, uh, this, plan, this map, this plan, uh, and you have a, a, a trail in the village, an explanation to see very small things, a house, a small workshop, uh, not very, absolutely no spectacular in fact, but uh, you can learn many things on this heritage in this uh, worker's village. I really think that this work on vernacular heritage is very important for this territory. It's more important for the local inhabitants than for the tourists, in fact. The, the aim is to give to the inhabitants a pride, a pride around this industri industrial identity, essential in the construction of a new town. So, at the end of this work, uh, we need to draw the frame I spoke about in the beginning. I tried to identify three models, three models, planned factory town, unplanned factory town, industrial city, which is a little bit apart. Uh, Pre-industrial city with the industrial district, the Faubourg Industriel. And these two models uh, can be uh, uh, dis dispatched between workers' villages, this is uh, uh, the Blue Arrow, eh? between workers' villages and factory towns, uh, um, with uh, the amount of uh, services, as I told earlier. Uh, there is no clear limit, in fact, between workers' villages and factory towns. And in fact, there is no clear limit between plan and unplanned. Here, uh, only ge industrial geosystem for a factory town. Here, several industrial geosystem for one factory town. There is no clear, cl really clear limit between them. Uh, I do this axis between between two poles, between the poles of planned factory town and the pole of unplanned factory towns. You can place your, uh, your own uh, factory town here of village, of workers' village here. I place Batavilles, very planned, Town les Vosges, planned but go to unplanned, and Fresneville, very unplanned, for example. And the, the main, there is no clear limit between them and it evolves during the times. But the the, uh, one, one, uh, one thing is sure is that the main train of evolution is from planned to unplanned. So I hope that this reflection about these uh, different categories of factory return could help our community to specify our vocabulary. And by the way, maybe we will need new words, new vocabulary for the new company terms built by Amazon or Google or Disney in some parts of the world. And the proposals are open for new words to uh, design these uh, towns. So thank you for your attention.